Uh, we're in a feed. Thank you. And uh, we're, we're, we're in Ephesians. And uh, last time we were in chapter two, um, and uh, if you remember, we we looked at the the way God saved us. There were two descriptions in chapter two of uh, salvation, um, and if you remember, we said. In, in verses 1 to uh, 3, he describes how lost we were, and he uses phrases like dead, under the influence of the world, its values and philosophies, under the influence of Satan, his power, his spirit, disobeying the law of God and the conscience, fulfilling the lusts of the flesh and the mind, and under wrath, that was a terrible description there in verses 1 to 3. And then in uh, the second description in verse 11, he describes, we were once nations uncircumcision, rejected by the Jews, without Christ, aliens, lost, strangers, no hope, without God. And then it ends that short two verses from 11 to 12 with the phrase again, but now. So we have two descriptions of being lost. And in the, uh, then it has this phrase, but God, and then in verse um, 13, but now. We have this tremendous contrast between <coughs> being lost and being saved. And the, the method of God, if you remember, when it was two weeks ago now, but I, I said that the difference is not that we climb up ourselves or we save ourselves, but we take the lift. We don't climb the stairs, we take the lift. Uh, if you had to climb the stairs to heaven, well, it would take you forever if there were stairs but there are there's no ladder you climb but there is a lift and the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and he takes us from the lowest chapter described to the highest we are seated with Christ in heavenly places so he describes this tremendous work of God to raise us up out of darkness. In the second description, um, verse 10, it goes down, it begins with God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. Even when we were dead in trespasses and sins, uh, in trespasses rather, made us alive together with Christ. And it goes on to say, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So he's, he's got this phrase workmanship, which actually Julie prayed about, that we are his workmanship. The word workmanship is actually based upon uh, a normal Greek word, meaning to, to make, to craft. It refers to craftsmanship, we get from it the word poem. Interestingly enough, it's the same word as poem. You could say, therefore, we are his poem. That would be a very, uh, what can I say, uh, it would be very uh, loose translation, but it would be a little bit straying into the English rather than the, the, the Greek. But it still has this notion of being, we are his craftsmanship, his workmanship. And some people translate it, we are his masterpiece. And I love that. We are God's masterpiece. Now when you think of being, about being I don't know if you think of yourself as God's masterpiece. You know, uh, uh, Leonardo da Vinci painted... Uh, Mona Lisa, his, his masterpiece. 
and you can look at other things, the Sistine Chapel and Michelangelo and all these things, and they're masterpiece. They poured all their time, all their skill, and they produced this unimprovable masterpiece. The, the master had produced his excellent work. And that's what salvation is. When you look at these two lists, God has saved us from sin to be his masterpiece. Uh, I notice this phrase, it comes in um, um, chapter 2, verse, uh, 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 which way verse it is, um, we were in disobedience and we were in all these things, but now we are taken from being children of wrath to being the masterpiece of God. Now, the second list actually is slightly different to the first list because he's actually contrasting us with Israel and he's introducing a new theme. He's actually talking about us and Israel. It's the theme of this section of the Bible from verse 11 to verse uh, 21 of this chapter. And then it goes on to, to talk a bit more about it in chapter 2. So the first list is just downright sinners. And it's talking about all the ways in which we were lost. Um, and, uh, I read this phrase. Uh, that sums up the the world of sin in the Gentile world in our in Britain today. It said, "Money, muscle, and mind are the gods of our present age." And I thought that was very interesting. Money, muscle, and mind. I would somehow link in their sex as well, but I, I couldn't think of a word beginning with M. So anyway. <laughs> Um, but the point is, that's the gods of this world, and God has saved us to be his masterpiece. The second list is about the fact that we were not part of God's people. And God has a people in this world called Israel. When you start talking about Israel, alarm bells kick go go off because there's controversy even among the Christians about Israel. What do you mean by Israel? And uh, Has God got two peoples, one Israel and one the church? And has the church replaced Israel? And This is a minefield and I'm not going to stray too far into it, but I'm bound to say some things that may upset some, probably people who are not here. So I've got <laughs> fairly safe ground. But the thing is, he's saying that God had a people, and this is true, this is a fact, that God had a people, starting with Abraham, and these were not like the Pharisees, like Caiaphas and the Sadducees. They were not in arrogance. They were the true people of God. And they were people like Abraham, Isaac, and later on in his life, Jacob and Joseph and Joshua and David. And you can see this large group of Israel Moses, who were included in a covenant with God. There's no doubt that when you come to the New Testament, the established religious order in Israel was out of step with God. So there is no doubt that over all the centuries there have been, and this is something that is stated very plainly in um, Romans chapter 9, that there are two Israels in this respect, or rather there's one Israel, but not all Israel are of Israel. Not every Jew is walking with God. Not every Jew has the faith of Abraham. And that's certainly true of Caiaphas. Jesus said, if you were of Abraham's seed, you would have loved me. You are not Abraham's seed, even though you're ethnically a Jew, because you don't love me, said Jesus. And so you have this, this, we've got to clarify a lot of things when we start talking about Israel, but really he's saying there is a 
there was a and there is a true people of Israel who are walking in the faith of Abraham when I look at um, Israel today are you conscious that it's very hard to say where the Jews are many of them don't believe in the God of Israel they're atheists and their Jewishness is a culture some believe different things and there are many Jews who do believe <coughs> in Jesus Christ but just to take it from this moment this take it from the fact of Old Testament era when Abraham and all those people I've mentioned were believed they were included they were chosen but the nations were not they were excluded and then the law of Moses came the um, the dietary laws and all the the laws of, um, uh, uh, of the rituals and the feasts and everything so in the second list He's actually saying not just a comparison of us when we were in sin, but a comparison of us with Israel. So let's read it in that light, verse 11. Therefore remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcised people, by what? By circumcised. The circumcised Jews called you uncircumcised. That at that time you were without Messiah, being aliens from the commonwealth, the citizenship of Israel, and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. And I think last time we talked about this, we emphasized the fact of being without hope, without God, without Christ. But here, we're emphasizing today the fact that he says when you were lost you were cut off from covenant relationship with God you were not part of his people Israel and the now verse 13 but now and we have this hinge again we've met, looked at it before and we're looking at it again but now in Messiah Jesus you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace. He's made us have peace with God, who has made both Jew and Gentile one. He has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in your ordinances so as to create in himself one new man from the two thus making peace and there you've got this astonishing statement by Paul that when Christ was crucified on that uh, on the cross he was he abolished through his death the enmity between Jew and Gentile which is the law So you can see he's moved on from just the comparison of when we were in sin and now we're saved. He's moved on to say this is now something that God did on the cross. He actually removed the need for the law. It's an astonishing statement and it means you don't have to, you can eat pork for lunch. Is that good news? <laughs> Maybe if you like it, I don't particularly like pork. And uh, lots of countries don't eat pork for dietary reasons, some for religious reasons. But you can actually have sweet and sour pork and it used to be saved. But the law is gone. And it goes on to say he's made in himself one new man from the two, from Jew and Gentile, thus making peace between Jews and Gentiles, between Jews and Palestinians. And that is actually true also, that there are Muslims in the Middle East getting saved. There are Jews, if I can say it, again, these are controversial words to some people, getting saved. 
but they're becoming one in Christ. And you find former Muslims and former Jews, when I say former Jews, you know that a Jew hasn't changed his religion. He's fulfilled his religion. That's why I say it's a bit difficult. I find it difficult to, without adding a lot of explanations and, and riders and say, don't worry, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying they've changed their... They are actually receiving the Messiah that was promised. But Jews and Gentiles in the Middle East, and I've got a couple of books. One is Son of Hamas, a man from Hamas, and he was in prison in a, in a place called Megiddo. There's a prison in Megiddo in Israel, and it was, it was full of Hamas uh, terrorists. And this guy got in there, and he was, he was a terrorist, and he was... He, it was awful. There was such hatred. They were killing each other in the prison, the, the, the terrorists, because they were mistrusting who's an informant, who's this. But uh, uh, somehow he came into contact with a, a converted Jew who, who loved him and showed him the love of God. And he said, how is this possible? It's the teaching of Jesus, he said, love your enemies. I follow Jesus Messiah, he said. And the man gave his life to Christ. It's a great book. Got another man, book, uh, book called I Was Arafat's Man. He was working in Arafat's entourage. And again, he came to Christ through love. Love your enemies. And he, he was staggered by this thought that there was a God who said, love your enemies. This so contradicted everything he'd heard. And he gave his life to Christ. And so God can reconcile today, literally, making of two, Arab and uh, Palestinian and a Jew, one in Messiah Jesus. And of course the word Messiah is a Jewish word. Christ is a Greek word. So a Messianic Jew is a Christian Jew. It's just the difference whether you call it Christian or Hebrew. Messianic is Hebrew, Christian is Greek. Messianic Jew. So this is what he's done. He's brought us in to covenant with the God of Israel. And he's made us one with the God of Israel. And that's Jehovah in the Old Testament. Uh, he was revealed as Jehovah. And of course, Jesus comes and says, I am. And so let's read on and finish this bit. He, 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 making peace, he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. So there is now no barrier. And there was a, uh, I don't know if I can find it in my notes here, but I, I always make these notes and never can find my way through. The sacred area of the temple in the New Testament times was... Uh, separated off there was a wall and and gentiles were warned don't cross this barrier on pain of death there was a wall and they discovered signs that were there indicating it. and joseph different historians wrote about it there was a wall but the, the the wall is broken down these are astonishing things now for us they may be more familiar but for the, uh, the, it, this was written to Gentiles, of course. And the word Gentile, by the way, is a very is a religious word. It's never used by, by people. It actually is a tr bad translation in that respect. We shouldn't use the word Gentile. We should just use the word nations. The Greek word just means nations. The nations. And he came and preached peace to you who are far off. And that's us, we're far off. And to those who are near, that's the Jew. So that all, both Jew and Gentile, can have peace with God through Christ. And when they find peace with God through Christ, they become one. And he says, verse 18, For through him we both have access by one Spirit to the Father. We're all one. This is perhaps not as shocking to you and me as it is to the readers of those times. This is a revolution. The law has been abolished through 
Christ, the need for the dietary laws, the rituals and all the feasts. Does that mean that if I was a missionary to Israel, I would eat pork? No, I would never give pork to my Jewish neighbours. I want to win them. And Paul would put himself under law to those who are under law to win them, not because he had to keep the law to be saved, but because he wanted to win people. Now let's read the conclusion of it, verse 19. Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. So he's, he said we are now being made one in the body of Christ, which is of course the church. Back on to this question, has the church replaced Israel? No, because... What you see is that the, the church is really what the, the people of, of Israel were to go into. On the day of Pentecost, there were no jet nations present except the, uh, the Jews who were there, and they became the first church. It did not replace Israel, but was the fulfillment of the promises of God to Israel. So when we are grafted into the church, we are grafted into one body with the Jews. The great difference, of course, now is, of course, that the, the Jews are now a very small minority in the church. The church is so big, covering all nations. But we still study the writings of Jews. We are still built on the foundations of Jewish apostles and prophets. Now, this plan to um, include the Gentiles, well, it's so wonderful, and it's, we're going to read a bit more about it in chapter, chapter 3. Let's read into chapter 3. I want to get to a, another couple of points. For this reason, verse 1 of chapter 3, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles. And you've got this phrase, he says, I'm in prison for you Gentiles. What do you mean, Paul? Well, I don't know if you remember reading in the book of Acts why Paul was arrested. It was because he preached that God loves the Gentiles. If you read chapter 22, he was, it was because he preached God loves the nations. And he was accused of bringing a Gentile, a, 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 one of the nations, into the temple area, which wasn't true. But he was in prison for this very subject. I'm in prison, he says, for this reason, for preaching to the nations. If indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I've just written a few verses before, by which, so that you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it is now revealed by his Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the nations, the Gentiles, should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Messiah through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. And there he says... I am preaching this mystery that is, was not made known before, that the nations, you and I here in this room, are included in the prophets, in the promises of God to Israel. And then he goes on to say in verse 8, To me, who am I'm less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the nations the unsearchable riches of Messiah, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, 
which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places. We'll stop there. That's as far as we'll go today, I'm guessing. So he's saying, I am preaching the, the riches of Messiah and I'm, sh I'm, I'm declaring this mystery, this change that has come, that this gospel is going into all the world. Now, it, it was prophesied, and you can find, for example, even in Abraham, he said, I will make you a blessing to all the families of the earth. All nations will be blessed in you. So it was there, the promise to the gen. But this idea that, that there would be this huge change, that the law would be gone and the, that everything would be different and we would be made one body, this is something that is the fullness of it is revealed here in the New Testament. When you look at this, you realize the New Testament, if you've ever seen the trilogy, um, uh, I, I've read the book and I've seen the film, um, Lord of the Rings. Have you noticed they always end on a, a cliffhanger? So you think, what's going to happen next? And I think in those cases, they used to bring the movie out about a year after the first one. So you had to, if you were just watching the movie, you had to wait a year to get the next cliffhanger. But you see, the, the Old Testament is incomplete. It's a cliffhanger. How's it all going to work out? How is God going to bring the Gentiles? Are they all going to get circumcised? Are they all going to keep the law of Moses? No. That's going to go. And that's, that's, that's the new thing, that, the complete thing that is revealed. But I want you to notice this. The, the last verse we read, that to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be known by the church to the principalities and powers looking on. Okay, so let's just stand back a bit from what we've been saying. Here's the gospel it's come. It's come that it can come to me whether I'm a Jew or a Gentile, whatever I'm, if I'm lost in my sin and my darkness, the power of Christ can overshadow me and make me, what did we say, a work of art, a masterpiece. <coughs> and that masterpiece is me in Christ. And in that work of God, the, the masterpiece goes on to say, he's making me part of a company of people. This isn't just individualism, he's making me part of a body. And this body is bigger than just a little local church. It's one with believers from, from Israel and from all the nations, God, and from all the, the believers in Epsom, from other churches who are following Jesus, this is a great work that is a marvel to the angels and the demonic powers that look on. So let's just think about this for a moment. We've only got a few minutes left, but let's just think about it. Let's just think about God's work of art when he made Adam. So there he is in the garden. He makes the, um, the man, uh, Adam, makes him of the dust of the earth. There's his body. And God has created things. But now something different happens. God comes to the man, Adam lifeless body he overshadows him breathes into him the breath of life the angels are watching the demons are watching and wondering what God is doing 
And this, as God steps back, the man opens his eyes, and here is a something that is the crowning glory of his workmanship, a masterpiece, a human being that can really can actually be in the image of God. And of course the powers of darkness, especially Satan, is, is filled with rage at this concept that God could indwell us and that we could be his special people and his special creation, his workmanship, they wanted to be that. They wanted to be all the, the, take the center stage. But God says, I make this man in our image. Then, of course, things go wrong. And then comes the Messiah. And there in Bethlehem, uh, sorry, in Nazareth, the Holy Spirit overshadows Mary and Again, there, the glory of God comes upon that woman. And there, in the womb of Mary, a child is conceived that again bears the image of God and the glory of God. A child, of course, this is a unique child because it is not just a, a, a man in the image of God. It is a man in the image of God, but it is the very Son of God himself who has taken on human form. So God in becoming a man it, it was still part of his plan because there's something about you and me that is God's masterpiece. And then he goes to the cross because he can't produce a masterpiece through law and he can't produce a masterpiece through instruction or teaching, he goes to the cross and he crucifies that old nature of Adam. He doesn't throw him away. He crucifies him in a, in a work that changes the very nature of the, of the human. So what God did in, in Christ on the cross was again he overshadowed a sinful humanity in himself because he had not deviated from his original plan. And then comes the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And the outpouring of the Holy Spirit so that as the Holy Spirit comes on sinners to transform us through the work of the cross and the work of the Holy Spirit comes into being in you and me the image of God and we appear through the work of the Holy Spirit, as a people, and according to the description here in chapter 2, who are not earthly, but heavenly, and seated with Christ in heavenly places. <coughs> so when the Holy Spirit has come upon us and God stands back to look at his creation, there is the most amazing thing imaginable that God has done it. He's made a people who bear his image and shine with his glory and are the fulfillment of his dreams. And he stands back from us and he says, look at my masterpiece, the church. They're all one here. When I ask myself, what is the, what is the great reason that the powers of darkness look on us in wonder and hatred angels looking on in wonder the angels of God the demons looking on in hatred there's principalities of Epsom and London and the southeast and the world all the different layers and hierarchies according to Ephesians they're all there what do they do they hate us because this we are able to rise above the spirit of this age and to be a people who shine in glory for the glory of God. How do we do that? There are many ways, and we'll have to look at them uh, another time in more detail. 
But just to sum them up, it's because we love Jesus and worship him in the spirit. Singing, making melody in our hearts to the Lord as we did this morning. But much, much more than that, or are they equal to that, but it's, it, we need that as well. But the greater thing is the love of, is the love. The love of God for us and the love of God through us. Because we don't divide. We don't criticize. We don't hurt one another. And if we do, we forgive one another. We, we have a, a life that reveals a love and a glory that are divine. When I think about the meaning of the Ephesian letter, I think the culmination is in so much of the scripture, I suppose it's true of the whole scripture, the culmination of everything is love. Not just sentimental love or just a, have a nice, but the, the love of God. The reason this body of, of people is so amazing in the earth, such a defiance to the powers of darkness is the power of love in us. Now I've, I, I, I must finish now but I, I suppose when I say these things you might say who is equal to these things? Are we a wonder to the powers of darkness here this morning? Has our worship defied hosts of wickedness? Has our singing entered into faith? Is our love fervent? Do we lay our lives down for one another? And I would say probably we'd all agree, in measure, yes. But we need to understand our calling. We are his masterpiece. God has come amongst us, Christ amongst us. We're going to, next, next time, uh, which will be next week, we'll look at chapter 3 a bit more and the wonder of Christ within us. We're going to look at that whole thing of the love of God in us. But the, 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 this is the goal of God, to make us a people of, of extravagant love for Jesus and, a, and of extravagant love for one another and for the lost and for all. That's what makes us this masterpiece. Amen. Let's pray, shall we? Lord, words are weak to express the wonder of what you've done. What you did on that cross to take people who were enemies and to make them one. But above all, to make us your own children, to make us those who love you and serve you and therefore love one another and worship you. Lord, we surrender ourselves this morning again to the Holy Spirit. Do come amongst us, even now this moment. Rekindle in our hearts this great fire of love for God and for each other. Let the masterpiece, in measure, the wonder of it, be unveiled. We pray this in Jesus' name.